Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Spencer Doerr. I'm with INAC, but today I'll be uh, representing the Government of Canada. Uh, with me, uh, some of the people are in attendance, some will be coming in shortly. Um, we have uh, John Price, Kim Pauley, and Alexander Ungnalowak from INAC, uh, Ken Landa, and Michelle Zarkinson from DOJ, Michelin Manzo, and Andrew Mayer from Parks Canada. Um, just want to thank the Commission for holding this meeting. I know it's been a bit of a logistical nightmare, and we're competing with the Arctic Winter Games. So <laughs> we have to have our hopes and prayers on success for this meeting and for our athletes. Um, moving from a caribou workshop to the fourth technical meeting, we, we find these meetings extremely important. It's where we share our information and our perspectives. And I think overall it helps us uh, build a common body of knowledge from which we can make better decisions. Um, the Government of Canada has always tried to assist MPC by providing expertise from a technical perspective so that we can develop a draft land use plan that can provide clarity, which includes alignment with legislation, the NLCA, and policy consistency. A plan that respects the authority, the roles, and the responsibilities of each of the implementing bodies. And ultimately, a plan that positively contributes to the environmental regulatory regime in Nunavut. Um, the lens or the role that the Government of Canada plays in relation to, to caribou, in particular, Canada recognizes the social, economic, and cultural importance of caribou in Nunavut and sees the significant public concern. Further, <laughs> further, that was a bit of a warning, Spencer. <laughs> so, <laughs> could you, I feel could like you Cuba Gooding Jr. at the Oscars. <laughs> um, could you slow down a little bit, though? Sorry. I yeah. know you're excited and, and all that. But. <laughs> further, we, we, we know that these concerns are shared beyond none of its borders, across the territory, and throughout Canada. Um, while the primary responsibility for caribou is with the public government, uh, the government of Nunavut, with co-management systems outlined in the NLCA. However, there are overlaps with what the government of Canada does in their responsibilities to support sustainable resource development and the protection of the environment. This includes INAC's responsibilities for land management um, and various federal wildlife acts and regulations. Another point that we'd just like to highlight is the Government of Canada does have responsibilities, as does the Government of Nunavut and NTI, for the acceptance of the Nunavut Land Use Plan. So collectively, we need to look for common ground and look for recommendations that provide a reasonable chance of a draft land use plan being accepted. This will invariably require that we listen and hear everyone's perspectives and try to incorporate them into the plan. So that being said, we look forward to the discussions. And thank you. I just wanted to take a minute to introduce uh, Jackson Hansen. He is a uh, Inuit Learning Development Program participant, 18-month uh, program that's developed by the Government of Canada and Inuit organizations to expose young Inuit to the workforce. The, the various uh, positions that are available in Nunavut uh, as a way to facilitate uh, their thinking about the types of careers that they might want. So Jackson is posted uh, at NTI at, uh, within policy and planning for the next four months. Tungwasiwit Jackson. Just a quick question, Spencer, and I'm just thinking on the fly here. Um, and I can appreciate your comment that majority of the wildlife management rests within the government of Nunavut. But um, I'm wondering, does the government of Canada does do like trends analysis on um, inspections related to exploration or major projects related to impacts on wildlife or, or, or caribou in this matter? Um, yeah, the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada has uh, uh, 
field enforcement unit, which does inspect uh, water licenses and authorizations on Crown land and water license on Inuit owned land. Uh, we do perform a summary to capture what we're looking at and you know what we're finding in the field. So those are produced, and we do um, provide copies of inspection reports which which get posted, i.e., on the the Nunavut Water Board um, website. And uh, I think I think we're available to provide uh, understandings of what we've seen in the field if if requested. But we, there's not necessarily, say, a trend analysis towards like caribou in that regard. Thank you, Spencer. The reason why I asked that, and maybe it was just a little too preliminary, but regardless of the, the caribou protection measure options that will propose or will be enforced within the land use plan, I'm just trying to get a better idea of the types of resources that the governments are willing to put into whatever measure we choose. And, and that's why I had asked our colleague from the GNWT earlier about the types of resources their government allocates to these types of things. I'm just trying to, 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 to better understand the types of resources we're willing to put around this table. Um. To steal Bruno's uh, comment, I could take that as an undertaking to find out, you know, some more detailed information on the resources that we expend for compliance and enforcement, and and other things that may be in relation to, say, caribou protection. Earl, well, thank you, Earl Evans, BQ Board. <clears throat> I had a question for Spencer here. Uh, just wondering if. Um, you're the right guy to talk to, and uh, I think Anna kind of touched on it there too. Is uh, any spare change you have would be greatly appreciated on our side too. Thank you. Uh, we we do support the Beverly Kamenari Management Board. Uh, we we have a representative as well, Eric Alain, as well. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take I'll take that on as an undertaking as well. as an undertaking to increase the resources or as an undertaking to look at increasing the resources? The latter. All right. Um, are there any other um, people in the room who would like to make a, a short presentation? I'm thinking of the, particularly of the elders on the, the back row. Um, if you'd like to... Um, Take, uh, say a few words, you'd be more than welcome to at this point. My name is Pasalemi Nakurungayu Kugaruk. With all the discussion this morning, I could understand most of it. It's related to caribou protection, anything related to it. What protection are you talking about? I hear that some appear not to want to protect it, and most are asking about protection measures. Now, here's my understanding. Protection measures and related to the species is what I'm understanding uh, from this morning. The protection we talk about as users and people, Inuit people, especially the calving areas. Is this what you're trying to solve this morning, today? If so, if so, what's there to talk about? It's been there for generations uh, and through here. What, what else are you talking about in protection? Is it protection for the mining companies, exploration companies? What is it that you're talking about? Who are you trying to protect? Kinello. Interested in adding to that? All right. Were there any other um, comments or questions that, that people had of the GN? Uh, I don't want to shortchange that in exchange. Warren. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, our president should be here in just a moment. I believe he, uh, uh, he's he been working uh, with his staff on a statement over the lunch break, and I think he'd like to present that when he returns. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not sure who uh, to turn to on that. Perhaps I can uh, uh, ask the Planning Commission um, what it expects to get out of this session, and uh, in addition to the obvious objectives. Thank you, David. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate for us to comment uh, before Bartholomew's questions answered. Mm -hmm. So clearly what we're looking, the Commission's role is to collect the data, have accurate data, and that what are the uses, what are the boundaries, what are the management parameters for core calving grounds, post calving grounds, water crossings, how, how do Inuit, how does government, how do communities, organizations want to see the management of caribou. We need definitive information. We need accurate information. Both scientific and traditional are recognized. And the Commission needs clear direction of what it is the parties want to see in this land use plan. When I hear case by case, well, what does that mean? we need a definition of what's case by case management is it spatial data is it uh, what how, what does that mean we need answers to these questions it's very important that we go away understanding what the parties what the elders government everyone is asking of the commission to do uh, i hope that answered the question mr chair thank you yeah, thanks, Sharon. And I, I guess I could add that um, I think what we're trying to do here is, is ensure that we have both a, a healthy economy, healthy caribou herds, and healthy communities. Um, so the direct answer to your question is, yeah, we're, we're trying to um, identify a path forward that, that will support those three central objectives which means uh, kind of looking after each one of them in the context of all the others. So are we talking about protection of uh, cavern grounds? Yep. Are we talking about uh, supporting a, a sustainable economy? Yes. Are we talking about um, ensuring that communities are healthy and the environment is healthy? Yes. So all of those things are being discussed here. The, the challenge is to come up with a an approach that that um, enables all objectives to be met without compromising uh, any one, and it's not a obviously not an easy task. Go ahead. Hmm? Thank you, Chair. I just want to say. To clarify this, the animals and the population living up here we coexist. The animals, we know that there's where there used to be no fuss. When it comes to animals, we know how to approach. We know how to control ourselves. And uh, at the time, there was a strict customs in order to achieve our our hunting in land. Uh, I'm saying this because you know, caribou appears to be disappearing, and we all agree to this. It's because sensitive to noise to the smell. They're not like us, they're acutely, uh, they could acutely smell, they could hear. Uh, 
uh, the whole territory at times in certain times is very noisy and this is a big factor and we have known this for generations when we hunted in the past. We, are, we were quiet, we didn't make any noises because we know how sensitive they were, their acute hearing, and uh, they were not easy to catch uh, because of their acuteness of smell, uh, hearing, and we have this knowledge for many years. And we were careful. And this has been our life for many years. Um, uh, and we wonder why they're disappearing now because of this noise. Uh, it's noise everywhere, coming from everywhere. And we ask ourselves, why is caribou disappearing? If you asked me as an elder, igloo dweller, I would have told you what the problem is. And. Uh, uh, machinery. Uh, we used to have serenity in hunting in the old days before everything arrived. Today they appear to disappear, the hunters. Um, there's aircraft hunting. They go to cable herd in aircraft, helicopters, and the noise it creates. And we wonder why it's disappearing. Thank you for this short notice. I would really love to participate with you to find solution. OK. Um, sure. Thank you, David. Just for Jimmy and everybody that's sitting back there, you are welcome to participate in the comments. So uh, just because you're sitting in the back row, Bartholomew, thank you for commenting. We do want to hear from everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. So we'll move on now to a um, discussion of season. Thanks, Chair. Um, this morning when we asked some questions to Steve, um, we couldn't get the answers that we were looking for. So regarding our questions and policy on calving grounds, I would like the Premier Taptuna to come here this evening and explain himself to us why they've changed their mind. Uh, we've dropped this letter before that we want to read out to everyone. It's going to government of Nunavut. Re government of Nunavut support for mining on caribou calving grounds. I am writing to you today to express my disappointment in the government of Nunavut's decision to support mining and mineral exploration in caribou calving grounds. The Kibadlak Wildlife Board has long supported protection for caribou calving grounds and was very happy that GN supported our position before. It was very disappointing to learn that the GN changed its mind and no longer wants to protect calving grounds. The KWB, Kibalak Wildlife Board, believes that GN has made a very irresponsible decision. Mining in caribou calving grounds could have detrimental impacts on hunters in the Kibalak region. And I know it's not only the Kibalak region. For many communities, especially Baker Lake and Ogbed, caribou is the main staple based on information presented by wildlife biologists, Inuit elders, and Kibalak hunters and trappers organizations. The KWB does not believe it is appropriate to allow mining and exploration activities in caribou calving grounds. The Kibadlak Wildlife Board and Kibadlak 
hunters and trappers have passed many resolutions and written countless letters opposing development in Nunavut's calving grounds. So have numerous Dene and Métis communities, the Beverly and Kamanakjo Caribou Management Board, and the World Wildlife Fund of Canada. I am also very disappointed in the way this decision was made. The perspectives of Kibaluk hunters do not seem to have been meaningfully considered. If they had, I do not believe that the GN would have passed a policy that provides no real protection for caribou habitat. I previously wrote to the Premier and Minister of Environment requesting that they work with the Kiwadluk HTOs and the Kiwadluk Wildlife Board on the issue of caribou habitat protection. I had hoped that the GN would consider Kiwadluk hunters and trappers' perspectives on land use planning and consult us on any policy changes and decisions. I have yet to receive a response to this letter. Last week, hunters and trappers from Chesterfield, Inlet, Ogbet, and Baker Lake wrote to MLAs expressing their views on land use planning. One of these letters was tabled to the Legislative SND Assembly by MLA Tom Sammoktok. Mr. Sammoktok said he would be asking detailed questions about the issue later in the sitting. However, a decision was made by Cabinet to support mining in calving grounds before Mr. Sammoktok was able to ask questions. This is an incredibly, incredibly important issue and one surely worthy of proper consultation and public decision. However, this discussion did not take place. We were given no official notice that the GN was considering changing its position on mining and calving grounds. There was no discussions about the issue in the Legislative Assembly, and there was certainly no engagement with the public on this question. I hope our regular MLAs will read up on the issue and take stand. It is not right for government to make major decisions without wildlife protection, without consulting the Inuit who help most of that wildlife on that wildlife. <coughs> Please table this letter attached document to a legislative assembly and discuss this issue for all Nunavu milk to hear. If you guys require any more information about this, give the wildlife board position on caribou habitat. Please do not hesitate to contact us. This letter we wrote and representing Kibaluk Wildlife Board, I signed the letter, so I hope things will get a bit better from this. Thanks. Thank you, Stanley. I suspect that will get their attention. Um, we'll see what the response is. Any other comments before I close off this part of the agenda? Leslie, the last word, perhaps? I just had a um, technical question again um, in terms of how our board would um, be writing letters of our own. So it would help us to understand how this position was developed because all we know right now is it's a GN position and um, the Department of Environment says it's not just a Department of Environment position, but we don't know what information the, the Department of Environment provided um, to the government and to the cabinet and how, how the decision was actually made, like it was the process. And it would help us to understand that so we could, you know, um, ask the right questions, I guess, when we write our letter. So I was wondering if we could get any information on that. Thank you. Steve, can you address that? Uh, thank you. Steve Pinkson, Government of Nunavut. If you're asking 
for the details of how the government of Nunavut came to this conclusion. I don't think I could provide that except to say that um, it was a senior decision made with input from the rest of the government of Nunavut and it's now an official government position. I can't really provide a, a detailed list of description of how that decision was made except it was an internal decision. Thank you. Warren. Thank you, Warren, for the Kivilik Wildlife Board. Um, does the GN have a response to Stanley's request that somebody who can provide that information come here, preferably a elected political representative? Is there any way that's feasible? We're right across the street from the ledge. They're not far. Uh, Steve Finkson, Government of Nunavut. If you're asking to to me to relay to the Premier's office that there's a request for him to come over or for someone to come over, I can certainly do that. I don't control their schedules, of course, so uh, is that if that's a request from this group or from the KWB, I can pass it along. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Warren for the KWB. Yes, please do. Uh, the Premier, a Cabinet Minister, somebody that sits in government, I think, should really come here and explain themselves to us. Um, during the break, the KWB discussed this with some other groups, and uh, we're not the only ones that feel this way. And uh, I think if anybody else does, it would be great if they spoke up now. Thank you. All right. Jackie. Kikitalik Wildlife Board supports KWB's request. We also sent our own letter last week to all members of the Legislative <coughs> Assembly. Um, so we are equally interested in the responses. Thank you. Earl. Yeah, Earl here from the BQ board. Yeah, I, we support the request to have a better explanation. Thank you. All right. Well, I think it's fair to say that there's, oh, sorry. Yes, uh, Peter Kapla from KRWB. Yeah, we're in support too for your we we'll also send a letter to the uh, department uh, to the regarding this matter. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So I, I'm going to wrap it up. I think it's fair to say that there's strong interest in, in hearing a, a more detailed explanation of what transpired. Earl? Yeah, could you ask him to bring some donuts too, please? <laughs> Yeah, you might have more success on that part. And, all right, let's go to uh, the uh, seasonal range discussion. Um, and it's the GN who is up to talk about seasonal ranges and a uh, brief on the precautionary principle. And I guess, Mitch, it's uh, all yours. And just to remind folks, uh, we've got about 45 minutes scheduled for the presentation, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. Um, I'm going to guess that perhaps the, um, if we could uh, cut the presentation a little bit and add to the discussion, that, that might be helpful. I think many people have already heard the presentation, seen the presentation. Okay, thanks very much. So <clears throat> I just want to state as well, before I get into the seasonal ranges, that um, the biology has not changed uh, of the issues surrounding um, all the concerns that are raised uh, around this table. I just want to make that statement before we get into it. Uh, then I will like to just briefly go over uh, seasonal ranges as the GN has uh, put them together. Again, those haven't changed either. We are fortunate as well to have um, one of our GIS uh, specialists here that um, can help explain any issues that people would like to discuss. I'd also like to mention that uh, we do have, as everyone knows, the last methodology that went out uh, was um, an abridged version because the document it came from was a draft document. We've gone ahead and prepared the final version um, or close to the final version of this document, which is a, a map atlas of uh, caribou, mainland caribou populations. That's an interjurisdictional map atlas that's been worked on 
between the uh, government of the Northwest Territories and the Nunavut government. We have some 40 or 50 peer-reviewed um, published articles uh, that support the methodologies used by the GN and plus a lot of other analysis that uh, will come in if, if folks would like to know about it. So we've locked that down pretty tight and um, the GN uh, strongly stands behind its position and its, its de delineation of the seasonal ranges. So Caribou and Nunavut, there are an estimated 19 populations and or subpopulations of caribou that are either wholly or partially within the Nunavut settlement area. Eight of these populations or subpopulations are mainland migratory caribou. They're also being called tundra winter or taiga wintering caribou. They go down to the trees generally during the winter. And the remainder are tundra wintering. So here's a breakdown of these mainland herds. The Blue Nose East is a mainland migratory. Dolphin and Union is a tundra wintering. The Bathurst is a mainland migratory. The Beverly is a mainland migratory. The Hayek is a tundra wintering. And the Kaminariak is a mainland migratory. The Lorillard, a tundra wintering. And the Wager Bay, a tundra wintering. There are fundamental differences uh, between these types of populations. There's also a lot of similarities. The annual core calving areas of all of these subpopulations are either entirely or mostly within the Nunavut settlement area. So we've discussed this already, but we need to just go over it quickly in terms of the range. It is a shared range. Uh, these ranges, uh, five of the eight subpopulations are shared with other jurisdictions. And there are other people relying on these populations. Blue Nose East is NWT and Nunavut. The Bathurst, Beverly, and Hayek are Saskatchewan and Nunavut. And the Kaminariak is the NWT, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Nunavut. So ma ma caribou management in Nunavut is shared with the regional wildlife boards, which are all represented here, and community HTOs. We consult with those boards and the HTOs regularly, multiple times a year, to make sure that we are trying to coordinate our approach. Nunavut has an obligation to involve other jurisdictions in caribou management. So some of the caribou ecotypes, so just flesh those out a little bit more. Of the mainland herds, there's two main ecotypes. And we've gone over those quickly, mainland migratory and tundra wintering. So the characteristics of mainland migratory caribou, they display the most extensive migratory behavior of all the different, or the two different ecotypes. That's not to say that the tundra winter are not migratory, it's just that these display an extensive migratory behavior. It, it exceeds uh, tundra wintering. They're generally sexually segregated throughout the year, except during the rut and fall migratory periods. Calving grounds tend to have cows and calves, yearlings around the periphery, bulls around the periphery, mostly breeding females and some non-breeding females in the center. And they're extensive, uh, or they migrate across the tundra range in spring, returning south to the forested areas early to late fall, where the rutting occurs. And their extensive seasonal movements make them less able to adapt to disturbance effects. One thing that does get discussed a lot, that it's pretty important to sort of um, to, to key out here, is all of these caribou populations are not all the same. Uh, it's, these mainland migratory populations are not hanging around one area in, in a way that they could get used, or acclim used to or acclimate to various noises or various smells as were or raised or various sites. And they migrate out before they have a chance. So every year it's a fresh experience. So mainland migratory caribou react a lot differently to potential disturbances on the land than a less migratory caribou herd might. And calving grounds and spring migratory corridors, they're the most defined and predictable. Uh, they're very small polygons for herds that often can reach hundreds of thousands. 
the actual areas they go to calve in are very small indeed in the smallest seasonal range of all of the seasonal ranges. So the characteristics of tundra wintering caribou, they display less extensive migratory behavior. They generally display less sec sexual segregation throughout the year except during the rut and uh, fall migratory periods when the sexes come together. They migrate across tundra rate, or sorry, they generally display less sexual segregation throughout the year. They rarely migrate to tree line, spending the entire year within tundra habitats. It's a key difference between the two. So a couple of things. A little bit less segregation goes on, and they, they spend their entire year, on most years, uh, their entire annual cycle within tundra habitats. Their less extensive seasonal movements may allow for a greater degree of adaptation to disturbance effects. So there can be a little bit of a, a difference there between those two ecotypes. And calving grounds and spring migratory corridors are less defined and predictable. They tend to be a little bit larger. A lot of the same rules apply, but there are some of these subtle differences between these two. So this is really a quick lay of the land. Um, you can see the mainland migratory population starting with the gold color uh, with the Kamenariak um, on the eastern side. Uh, to the north are two tundra wintering populations, the Lorillard and the Wager Bay. As we move uh, west, we get into the Beverly herd and the Hayek herd. The Hayek first and then the Beverly, but there's a lot of overlap on winter range. And then we get into the Bathurst and Blue Nose East, Blue Nose West and on. Um, outside of Nunavut. So seasonal range. Uh, we base this on collar-derived caribou movement rates. So we don't make the, in the earlier periods, uh, biologists, and they did a very good job, would get together and talk to also community members to try and discern when the breaks were for these various seasonal ranges, when they started, when they finished. And we've chosen to let the caribou sort of speak to that by looking at their movement rates. And their movement rates do show differences, and we can bind them into important periods just based on that. So the, the periods that we did manage to flesh out are calving, post-calving, summer, late summer, fall migration and pre-breeding. It's like a pre-breeding migration, a rut, that's uh, the breeding process. Fall migration and post-breeding, so movement off of the rutting grounds into the winter habitat. And then winter, and followed by spring migration back up to calving grounds. <coughs> so this is an example of what I was meaning in looking at caribou data and letting the caribou talk. This is not heavily modeled data at all. This is daily averages <laughs> that are plotted. This is actually what the caribou are doing. We didn't smooth anything out to make it look better. This is the, this is the movement rates of these caribou speaking, like very strongly. And it's very similar across the mainland migratory populations. And you can see there's very distinct periods. So here's the winter period, which is characterized by lower movement rates, uh, trying to conserve energy. There's a lot of different reasons for that that we'll get into. Spring migration, where you see a, a peak in uh, movement activity on their way up to the calving grounds. Calving, and this calving is not only unique spatially in a very small polygon, not only do the caribou move 400 to 500 kilometers to actually get there, not only do they move against the growing season, they move as, as things green up, they're actually moving away. But it's also a period of time when their movement rates are consistently at their lowest. So these animals are looking for a quiet area to have their young, and their movement rates display this. Very, very significant period. Then we have post-calving, which is rearing and the initial getting the, the, the calves more mobile and able to stick with their, um, with their mums, and heavy lactation. Then we move through the summer period, which is characterized mostly by large movement. We'll get into that insect harassment. Then late summer, which is a slowing down. Caribou are packing on uh, the poundage. And fall migration. And in fall migration, I've, I've combined in here the two periods, the pre and the, the, the post-rut 
But here's where the rut occurs in the middle of that migratory period, right at the peak of that scale. So a couple of other things to look at here that, are, um, that come out of this data, which is pretty incredible. So it's not by chance that this migration begins when the wolf pups are born. In fact, this comes from IQ as well. And it's a consistent message across science and IQ, peer-reviewed uh, literature, and uh, the experiences gathered around this table of a, a lot of different biologists that have been working on caribou their whole careers, myself included. And what is happening, we believe, although there's, you know, is that caribou are distancing. Once the wolves have their pups, they're tied to the dens, and the caribou can move off. It makes it a lot more difficult for wolves to follow and bring food back to the pups. So, and this is also um, discussed by hunters and, and elders that we've spoken to over the years that uh, indicate the same thing. So the caribou distance themselves from predators and disturbance events related to predation. Another couple of key periods. Um, these are the periods right after calving where we have um, the feeding, key feeding. There's not a lot of insects. The forage is of very good quality and they're able to spend time feeding during these periods. And they're the only periods during the summer where caribou can pack on the food. If those periods are disrupted, that can impact the, the health and the, the viability of uh, caribou populations. Now, the, the one period to look at specifically is the post-calving period. If you notice, not only is post-calving important uh, for caribou, but it's a key feeding period. The, f the shoots are coming out from the vegetation are young, they're full of energy, and they're very palatable, and caribou are packing that on. And it happens during the same period when uh, lactation is at its um, highest for nur uh, nursing calves. Then we have high movements uh, due to insect harassment. An interesting spike. We see this spike on most of these populations, pretty much all of them, and we have warble fly and bot fly emergence. So you can see the reaction of caribou to these biting insects. This speaks to insect avoidance habitat during these periods. Where can caribou go to get away from this? So I'm not going to spend too much time here. What I wanted to do is show that this particular method that we're using is used. Every single herd has its own profile. We do not take one herd or join them all together. We look at each herd and we develop these profiles for them and come out with these movement rates and these seasonal break periods. So there isn't a, po a calving start and stop period that's the same for all of these populations. Each population speaks through their movement rates as to where those critical periods are and we use that to generate the, the seasonal maps. So I'm just going to go quickly through the different um, calving periods and then we can, we can maybe have some questions or the different uh, seasonal periods. So we'll go quickly with some uh, characteristics of these seasonal ranges and sensitivities to the seasonal ranges. So in calving, it's late May to early June, and that's a rough estimate. Each population varies a tiny bit, but that's just a rough guideline. So characteristics are they're spatially the most concentrated and predictable seasonal range with the lowest daily movement rates. And these are both substantial uh, um, events that happen during that one period. Predominantly occupied by breeding and non-breeding females and newborn calves. As I was saying earlier, yearlings and bulls are generally to the outskirts. There can be a little bit mixing in, but they're generally segregated. Spatial extents are exclusively within tundra habitats, offering limited cover to visual or audible disturbance. It's a key thing. A lot of measures that have been used in the past are being applied from taiga sites and they're being toted as effective measures, but trees absorb sound and trees block visual stimuli. We don't have that in these areas. These are tundra areas. They're characterized by low densities of predators and little to no human harvest. It's a time of year where you can't really get a skidoo in, you can't get an ATV in, you can only really fly in. So by the virtue of the time of year, it's really protected from almost every kind of disturbance you could imagine. As Bruno had said earlier, um, David has been there, I have been there, many people here have been on calving grounds. It's a very quiet place um, where caribou are not running around, they're nursing their calves and giving birth. 
and there's not a lot of activity. Recent predator studies also show that predator, or predator frequencies on calving grounds are very low compared to other parts of their range. And commonly areas with few foraging opportunities, but they're adjacent to areas that will have foraging opportunities. Another key feature that are, is often missed, um, and you've got to look at all these different components. Calving grounds not only have the area to have young, but they're in the vicinity of areas that have high grade vegetation. So it's not just one thing they're going, it's multiple things. And there's not a lot of areas having looked at vegetation data that we've had across the, the, the our region, the Kivalik region, um, the region I work in. Uh, there's, there's almost no places that look like that, that have that combination. So these areas are not necessarily replaceable. Where we can find other areas, oftentimes caribou might be able to move in there. As an example for Kamen area, no other area exists on their range that we've identified. So vulnerability, sensitivities, they're vulnerable to all disturbance effects. And this is at the greatest during this period. They're having young. They're trying to keep their young from trouble. They're trying to, to keep disturbance down, keep predation down. Caribou generally on cavity grounds see any kinds of disturbances as predation and they'll move away from it. And calf abandonment is very high during this time of year. So it's very, very sensitive of all the seasonal ranges, the most sensitive period. Energy demands reach a peak throughout this period while forage opportunities remain low because remember we're waiting to get into post calving for the green up to start so that these animals can start feeding. So these caribou have got to nurse these youngs until that happens. And so there's a lot of energetic demands on cows with calves. Any energetic demands that are on top of what would normally or naturally be there are going to take away from calf condition and the survivability of that animal. And that's been shown in a considerable volume of peer-reviewed literature for ungulates. Flight responses to any form of visual or sound disturbance is the greatest during this period. We've had on the ground experiences with this. Caribou will run and keep, we had several caribou run and keep on running um, from foot traffic on the calving ground uh, till the caribou were out of sight and abandonment of the calf in the process. Susceptibility to disruption of the cow-calf bond is at a peak throughout this period. So, until the female has um, invested a lot of energy into its calf, that bond is very weak and the female will abandon that calf to save itself. It's an evolutionary um, adaptation that allows breeding females to survive to the next year to produce calves again. And the high densities of cows and calves within a small geographic area warn of the high potential for disturbance related spatial and population level impacts during this period. Densities are of their highest during this period, sometimes exceeding four and 500 caribou per kilometer squared. Huge numbers in very tight spaces and year after year. Um, oops. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so this is the calving ground and we can put this up. Um, these are the polygons that uh, have been generated for calving, seasonal range, all the way up to the 100% utilization distribution. And as you get darker, those are the higher density areas. So post-calving in summer is late June to mid-August. Characteristics and sensitivities. It's a time of year when the uh, energy demands on cows nursing calves are extremely high. Calf survival depends on intact cow-calf bonds and continuous milk production. Continuous milk production requires continuous feeding. Generally occurs within and directly adjacent to calving grounds. Primarily cow, calf and yearling groups move together in search of high quality forage to sustain milk production and build fat reserves. More extensive than calving grounds, but similarly used in a temporally, so time-wise and spatially predictive manner. Biting insect emergence begins and increases throughout the latter half of this period. And the most extensive daily movement rates occur during the latter half of this period as uh, insects start to harass more and more animals. 
Sensitivities. Biting insects can significantly increase energy expenditures impacting forage intake and milk production. There are high energetic costs associated with the displacement of caribou from insect avoidance habitat. Displacement of cow-calf pairs into marginal habitats will reduce energy intake and in turn milk production. This is a very real thing that has been documented. These aren't things we're just dreaming up. This is all based in science and observation. Susceptibility to calf abandonment throughout the period. Environmental stressors are generally low early in this period, allowing for extensive foraging. That's in the early stages. Remember that circle of the high energy forage intake. Mechanized transport, aircraft, roads, and their effects on increasing disturbance and human harvesting are of the greatest concern within these areas because they disrupt caribou from feeding and from taking care of their calves. And you disrupt feeding, you disrupt milk production. General disruption of foraging behavior of cow-calf groups will negatively affect cow health and calf survival. Again, this is grounded in peer-reviewed literature. This is not something we're pulling out of the air. This is factual. And here we have uh, just a general uh, look at the post-calving area. Again, smaller polygons, but quite a bit bigger than the, uh, than the calving areas that we're showing earlier. And then actually we're including summer, so early summer there as well. So you can see how it's starting. These areas are starting to expand. So late summer, which is mid-August to mid-September, biting insects steadily decline during this period. Forage intake is maximized during this period while forage quality declines. So you remember that other circle on the downside of that high insect harassment. Um, the only problem with that time of year is we're getting towards fall and the vegetation is losing some of its quality. Still good, but they again need to maximize forage intake. A time of year when environmental stressors are low, allowing caribou to focus on forage intake and the storage of excess energy is fat. Geographically extensive, Though foraging caribou are often selecting for small patches of higher quality forage. It's not just this huge vast area that they can take advantage of. They literally need to go out there and search for that high, those high quality patches. A lot of the, the activity we see in late summer is movement between patches. If a caribou is disturbed in those areas, they will move off and, and try and relocate another area because they need to keep feeding. Uninterrupted foraging during this period is critical to reproductive success, including the rutting process, um, as well as the later calving past the rutting process. And it's also critical to overwinter survival. This is the last chance these animals to have to get good fat reserves on. And movement rates are generally low during this period. So sensitivities, high sensitivity to forage, forage disruption, with the potential to strongly impact energy uptake and fat production. Low movement rates make caribou on their late summer range particularly susceptible to roads and their characteristic of increasing, increasing hunting pressure and general disturbance. And when disturbed, forage patches can take considerable time and energy to relocate. Cumulative effects, particularly centered around roads, aerial disturbance, Harvesting pressure and predation are of the greatest concern during this period. And you can see how these areas are starting to expand even more. So we do have larger areas. <coughs> Fall migration and rut. Characteristics, the time of year when breeding occurs. All ages and sexes come together generally occurs in the vicinity of the tree line for mainland migratory herds. Primarily cow-calf groups migrate from the tundra environment into the forested environment for the mainland migratory or into the more southerly extents of their annual range for the tundra wintering. Cow-calf groups join up with mature and young bulls generally in the vicinity of the tree line for mainland migratory and though geogra geographically extensive, 
Caribou generally utilize these areas in a predictable manner. Um, if you look at the sport hunting industry across the north, they have lodges in specific places and they get rutting caribou coming back into that area or the beginning of the ruts in many of those areas over and over again. So there is a predictability to it. Sensitivities, migration and breeding are energetically demanding primarily to mature bulls. So this is a hard time of year for a mature bull because they're just about to go into the winter and they're putting out a lot of energy to breed. Disruption of the breeding process will increase energy demands and impact breeding success. It occurs just prior to the winter season when the amount of stored energy will directly affect overwinter survival and overall productivity. And these ranges are generally extensive. Uh, obstruction and or diversion of pre-rut migrating caribou can substantially disrupt the breeding process, like animals not arriving onto their rutting grounds. Cumulative effects, as they apply to the dis disruption of migrating caribou in the breeding process, are of the greatest concern within these seasonal ranges. And here's an example of pre-rut. Here are the rutting areas. Again, the darker colors are the concentrated areas. And these are the post-rutting uh, where caribou are going on to their winter range. Just two more here and then we're through. Winter range, mid-December to mid-April. Characteristics, it's a time of year when energetic stressors are at their greatest. Forage quality, quantity and accessibility can be highly variable from year to year, but is generally low generally occurs within the tree line for mainland migratory herds. Movement is generally low, though can vary with levels of predation, harvesting, and snow conditions. Spatial use of winter range is highly dependent on fire history, weather, roads, and harvesting pressure. The most geographically extensive range of all the seasonal ranges. And so the sensitivities, caribou are particularly susceptible to roads and associated harvesting pressure. It is harder to locate and maintain feeding areas uh, during the winter season. There is more space out there, but it's hard to, to, to get them. Roads bringing in any kind of, uh, they, their pathways for predation, for predators to move down, uh, makes those populations more susceptible to harvesting. All these things will cause those animals to abandon those sites. In the winter time, that is a huge energetic cost and they may not be able to relocate another good site again and that's going to impact them throughout the rest of the year. Snow thickness, icing, forest fires and harvesting pressure can heavily impact caribou condition and survival. Severe winters can push caribou past stored energy thresholds, uh, reducing their overall survival or their productivity. So, and one of these things can be what they term a reproductive pause, which uh, caribou will skip one year of breeding, which can heavily impact uh, population demographically. Late winter yarding behavior can concentrate caribou into small areas. Uh, disturbing caribou within these areas can reduce survival. Generally, they're in those areas because movement outside of them is difficult. Uh, sun crust formation, things like this, that. And cumulative effects, particularly centered around roads and associated harvesting pressure and disturbance are of the greatest concerns, again, because of the size of the areas. So here's the winter range. It covers a pretty big swath of ground. So you can see that uh, cumulative effects need to be considered um, to know how much of the winter range is being removed from uh, caribou's ability to access. And this is the final one, and then we can have some questions. The spring migratory period is mid-April to late May. It begins following the wolf denning and pupping, restricting a pack's ability to follow migrating caribou. A time of year characterized by declining ener energy reserves and increasing energetic demands for parturient cows, so for pregnant cows. Forage quality and accessibility along migratory corridors is generally very low. 
primarily cow and calf and yearling groups, migrate from the wintering grounds to the calving grounds. Migratory corridors are generally linear and used annually in a spatially predictable manner. And daily movement rates are high during this period, often covering hundreds of kilometers, four to 600 kilometers generally. Sensitivities, disruption and or diversion of migrating caribou can have serious energetic consequences. High susceptibility to predation during this period. Diversion of the spring migrating caribou could delay arrival times onto calving grounds, leading to calving outside of these areas and corresponding increases in predation and reduced calving success. This again is a well-documented phenomenon in the literature. Disturbance of migrating caribou can modify spring migratory corridors and calving extents. And linear features, obstructions, or disturbance during migration can disrupt and or divert caribou. Again, a lot of this stuff, we've, we've seen uh, now recent work that's come out showing the effects of roads on migration, um, fairly serious effects. And we also have a lot of good IQ talking about how if leaders uh, in a migratory group are disrupted or turned, it will lead almost the entire group um, onto a, a different, into a different area. So these are all really well founded. And you can see too that these corridors, if you look at the, I'm not sure. Anyway, we've got a quick, oh, we've got that one. If you look at that, those corridors, We've, uh, you can see that they're very distinct. Spring migratory corridors are some of the most predictable of all the, the migratory corridors. Do you have that uh, animation? Oh, okay. So we've got an animation too that we just put up. Uh, we could just put up there in a second when we get the computer back up and running. But is there, we, I guess we could field some questions right now while we're getting this thing running. Miguel. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, Miguel with NTI. Uh, Mitch, thanks for the presentation. It was great. I always, I always like to see the uh, correlations between uh, events in the wild and, uh, and the movements of caribou. It's, uh, the warble fly thing is, is really interesting. Um, I wonder, uh, you, you made the distinction between the uh, tundra wintering and the mainland migratory. And uh, would it make sense to have at least two management approaches to address each of the types of herds? Um, I, I mean, if not for each, each herd uh, separately. Uh, and, and I know that we have, you know, it's, a, it's an early plan and, uh, and maybe we can't get everything in there. But uh, I'm just wondering, would it make sense to do so? And uh, if you were just to separate it into the two different herds, uh, the tundra or the tundra wintering and the uh, migratory, or mainland migratory. Uh, can you suggest some differences that there could be made in those approaches if you would agree to that? Thank you. I think that we would have to, it, it's certainly something that's documented that we're seeing a stronger evidence of. It would be something that I think would be worthwhile talking about further, absolutely. Uh, there are some pretty substantial differences between the two groups, although general behaviors and sensitivities remain fairly consistent. Notably, <clears throat> that calving grounds for tundra wintering caribou herds tend to be quite a bit larger, and um, uh, although predictable, not the same as, as a mainland migratory. I think that that is something that, um, looking at how those differences <coughs> might play out in, uh, um, in the plan is something that we certainly could look at and would be willing, obviously, to look at and, and with our, all the other colleagues here. And it could be a worthwhile exercise. I, I don't know if that answers your... Thanks, Mitch. Um, do you want to describe the video? Okay, so the main idea behind this video 
uh, or this, this animation is to try and talk about, um, uh, when we talk about, uh, when we used to talk about key access corridors, it's hard to get my head in the game on this, but um, keep everything straight, but because we're so used to um, a different approach. But I want people just to look at, we're looking at telemetry dates September, October, October, Let's wait until she comes around. November, December, January, February, March. Now we're starting to come into spring migration shortly. You can see how the animals are starting. Watch them come up into that calving ground on all of those. This is multi years of data, and it's absolutely predictable beyond what you could possibly imagine because there's only certain corridors these caribou can use. The point of looking at this is to understand that these are not static uh, polygons that we've got here. Caribou flow onto and off of these polygons. So, if the caribou are utilizing, in case in point, the north end of their uh, core calving area, there's a lot of real estate between where they got to come from and where they got to go to before they get there. So it's not just looking at spatial prints. It's looking at also the movement of animals across that and uh, making sure that that movement is not disrupted so that the caribou can make full use of these core calving areas. So that's what, this, what we're really trying to show here because oftentimes we see maps and it's, it's not fluid, but what is really going on out there is very dynamic and much more complex than a lot of people um, that may not be dealing in, with caribou um, all the time uh, necessarily understand. So that's what this animation is trying to show folks. Thanks, Mitch. Um, yeah, Earl. Thank you, Earl Evans, BQ Board. I have a couple of questions for Mitch. Uh, one of them is regarding the, the vegetation atlas that uh, Nunavut has been working on for several years. I know it's complete. And um, I heard you say that this high quality forage is only found in the core calving areas. That's, That's where the yeah. caribou go there. Is that correct? It's found in association with and some on the core and some around the core, but it's close by. So if you look at, if you look at here's calving right now, and if you look at calving coming out into post calving, you see it's in the vicinity of the calving area. So, and if you look, um, we are running uh, resource selection function models. Um, we're kind of in the middle of working on that right now, which looks at caribou use and the habitats from that same map system. And uh, we have just bits and quips of things that we've seen that there's a lot of um, really high quality habitat in the vicinity of the calving ground that doesn't appear to be in the same combination anywhere else on the annual range of the Kaminariak herd. So um, on some of these other populations, there were multiple, there, there has been multiple areas. This is all the very beginning of looking at this. So I wouldn't say, I would say that there are good feeding areas um, in the calving grounds, but most of those areas are just in the vicinity, just outside. It's very rocky in the center of the calving ground, and then it gets to a lot of uh, wetlands as you move out a little ways outside of the calving area, the core calving area. So it's a bit of a, bit of a mix of both. Uh, I've seen that, uh, that atlas, and it's a lot of work went into that, and it looks very detailed. And So I was wondering if you are to overlay, go to that, page on the atlas and look at the vegetation on that, that would, that would tell you that that's what's on the ground because you guys have checked that out, right? What's there? Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct and it's exactly what we're doing right now. We just haven't got to the, the end point of doing the analysis, but that's exactly what we're doing. We're in the middle of working with that with John Belanger and actually Cassless. Um, uh, a, a firm we've been working with for the GIS. So it's, it's ongoing right now, yeah. One second quick question. Um, the Beverly herd uh, this year for some reason, I think it's the first time that 
I've ever seen it. They wintered up on the coast this winter. So in your estimation, do you think that the energetic costs of them not coming down to the migration and, and having to migrate back in the spring and no hunting pressure up on the coast, do you think you can expect the increase in the number in that herd this year? It's really hard to say because it's going to depend on what the food was like where they were. If they had a hard time finding food and there's other reasons, maybe burns, why they couldn't penetrate into the taiga, um, you know, it's hard to, we'd have to figure that out. And I haven't really looked into that aspect and it, I don't think we have a lot of information that would help us do that at this point in time. Um, but uh, we will probably find out because we're scheduled to go into the Beverly herd this year and run a reconnaissance. So we'll be looking at calf production and relative densities across the, uh, the Beverly calving ground. So we'll be able to better report back as to whether that had an effect or not. Thank you, Mitch. And uh, I was just talking to some of the trappers that were up on that north end and they said this winter there was a lot of overflow and a lot of real bad ice up in the area and they figure that's why the caribou didn't come down below the tree line there because the conditions weren't very good. And that's a really interesting observation because that's happened a few times uh, uh, reported by Lac Brochet and Tadouli Lake residents that the caribou in years that they didn't come down they said the rivers were very undependable and very dangerous to travel and they figured that that had something to do with the caribou not penetrating further into the taiga. Uh, the people I'm here with are my co-board. Mitch, I have no question for you. Uh, you are talking about caribou herds before you were born that I have knowledge of. But just a short statement. You only have three days on caribou workshop and various items you're talking about in caribou. Uh, government have given us a task to attend this meeting under IQ. The cabin grounds disturbance according to our knowledge and, and, and just a day later after all that work the government has completely destroyed our work in reverse of their policies when we heard a few days ago but here I just want to say uh, it appears that uh, for those involved in wildlife you appear to have uh, uh, something against exploration and mining. My first career, I worked there up in Alert in 1967 and up there during my stay. It, towards the end of 1960s, I moved over to Panarctic in Queens Island. Uh, the person I wanted to, the Greece feared Mary, she have intimate knowledge in caribou and muskox movement uh, when Panarctic one is in heyday. Uh, she's not feeling well, so she is in my discussion with her. I live in Nikolaid. I know I'll be buried in, in Nunavut. I've been up here for 68 years. I'm not originally from Nikolaid. I'm from Arctic Bay. Uh, the knowledge and what I have seen, what I have heard, we were voiceless at times. But here, while we're here, we all should be aware that exploration and mining companies and, and uh, government have spent a great deal of uh, fighting uh, uh, these two industries. You've spent quite a bit of money. And I think what's dangerous in our knowledge, uh, the government, when they count polar bears and caribou, for example, um, 
but but uh, our wildlife it's hard to predict what's going on now with wildlife even here in government statistics polar bears and uh, and many have come out uh, suffering like uh, some people have uh, some food are not some polar bears are not good for food anymore. They're all marked uh, marked by by uh, government establishments uh, studies uh, according to Inuit Karimaya Tokangit. Some uh, uh, your researches are really undesirable to look at. Uh, you use nets, you use needles, and you show it on TV and tell us that this is a rational study. It really hurts my heart. Uh, you don't tell us how long you chased a caribou in order to net it. You don't tell us how many you have killed or studies have killed in their course of studies. When there's too much stress, in caribou's they die so so you tell me something makes a rational study where they are where they're going that's very rational it's ideal basically uh, caribou where have they gone it's from the noise you say it's from helicopters it's from the noise uh, all against caribou so and you say they they vanish because of these uh, uh, noises. I worked in Nanisibik. I worked everywhere in, in the in industry. I could tell you a lot of stories, but but animals, animals are not only uh, research. There's too much of that. Sometimes they don't go back to their original habitations. For instance, polar bear. When I was younger, we scoped it far away. And from here, we stalk, we plan. And how do we get that polar bear today? We, this is our hunting system. Uh, we see we only go after them now when we see them from our eyes so close and we just shoot them we just shoot them so the animal behavior 1940s and 60s have changed drastically they're not what they were before like today uh, our poor our wildlife change now due to something they come in now to the communities scourging for food i just want to say government of nunavut and and uh, mining companies says uh, you know, government has spent a great deal on research and we uh, they're no worse than mining companies exploration companies everybody is the same across the board so if government can't comply to what people need following in the economy if you believe in the land and community HTOs, the population of Nunavut should hear. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. I need coffee. Um, sure, yeah. Could I have a coffee, please? Luigi Tredi. Luigi Tredi. You might talk. I think, uh, if I heard correctly, the yeah. transmitter needs a break, so... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I do have to go. Yeah, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Okay. Let's take a few Decision-making on the polygons and, and how they were applied to the map. So the question to the, the GN is, um, is that, is the representation of those uh, calving and post-calving polygons on the land use map, uh, the, the representations that the GN wish to see on the land use plan? And I've got two others to follow up. 
Uh, no, no, they weren't. They were separate from the original GM submission. But the individual polygons were, were accurate, but they're just merged into a different polygon. <coughs> Okay, uh, Luigi Toretti, Kitik Maurino Association. I, uh, for clarification, uh, can can you provide information on how the GN would have liked the polygons represented? Well, um, before <laughs> or after? <laughs> It's, it's confusing for me actually right now. Um, the, I'll, I'll just say in the previous um, submission, which has been changed now, but in the previous uh, old GN submission, uh, the intent was to um, uh, look for protection on only the calving ground polygon and not on the post calving polygon. That was meant to um, the uh, post like seasonal protection in there now of course um, as Steve had indicated this morning that that GM position has changed but that was the old the old position that we had um, had submitted does that clarify uh, thank you Mitch uh, Luigi Toretti Kitakmiori North Association yes that does clarify um, and the, yeah, I appreciate the difficult position that you're in trying to walking through the weeds. <laughs> um, I, 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 so that was a question before that was kind of developed before this, this meeting. Uh, and, and obviously there was a clarification on the GN position. Uh, uh, the, the Department of Environment uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the question, but I suspect you haven't had the time to address it. Uh, one of the things that I would really like to see moving forward is, um, are we able to uh, get to a point or a position where uh, if, if some level of mobile protection measures was the choice to go with, um, has the GN considered what specific measures would uh, be acceptable to them? I think that's the kind of the can of worms that we need to open up and, and, and work our way through. Uh, so again, just to clarify, uh, what recommendations would the GN make to improve mobile protection measures? Just, just an interjection. There's more than one can of worms in that one. Um, and and I, I want to go back to your answer, Mitch, but answer this one first and then. Um, we, we can't answer that at all, actually. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm unable to answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay, and Luigi, just let me revisit the first question you answered. We've heard that the recent uh, change in, in policy direction was not science-based. We've also heard that the science-based uh, evidence that you've put on the table, the policy about how to apply that aside, stands. So the polygons that you've developed for the ranges, including the calving grounds, stand. All right. Despite the policy, the map stays the same. The application of the map is the question. Um, I guess I would, I would uh, pose the question once again then in terms of, um, uh, if, if I understood the answer uh, that it was is, is it true that it is strictly the calving grounds that were put forward as areas uh, that the GN would like to see restrictions on? And, uh, uh, or is it both the calving and post-calving? And, and sorry, that there's a, I've got another question, but I just want a clarification on that point. 
Okay, so again, I just want to make the, um, the differentiation that in the old submission that uh, was uh, the last submission that was sent into NPC, or the, the older one, uh, we, the GN position at that time was to only have area protection for the calving polygons, not for the post-calving polygons. In the post-calving polygons, um, the old submission was to look for seasonal uh, protections in there. So they, there is only one area of protection that was put forward in the old position. That was only for that smaller calving polygon. And I, I want to go back to this again because I, I want it real clear um, what I'm driving at. The map, the the maps that it, GN has put forward um, with regard to um, caribou use of the range are still scientifically valid from the GN's perspective. What has changed, at least with respect to the calving grounds, is that the GN's current position is that those calving grounds would not be protected. However, the area of the calving grounds is not being challenged internally within the government of Nunavut. That science stands. The um, decision that was made to change the policy on how to approach protection of caribou has changed, but not the map that shows the ranges. So, and, and there are other organizations that still um, advocate protection of those mapped calving grounds, aside from the GN's position. Is that correct, Mitch? Okay. Could you put that on the record, please? Yes, Mitch Campbell, Government of Nunavut. Um, so the polygons that were originally developed um, uh, and submitted to MPC are still the same. How the polygons are going to be treated is, uh, is what has changed in the, the GN policy. Luigi Toretti, Katikmawadi uh, Nur Association. Okay, uh, I guess the question ends up to the NPC. Um, uh, in light of the um, the clarification from the GN uh, that the post calving uh, not necessarily have restriction, but have uh, some form of mobile protection measures. Uh, how will will the NPC uh, separate those? Polygons will will they be considered different polygons? Protection on the calving po polygons and um, uh, or restrictions on the um, calving polygons and some type of special management on the uh, post calving. Okay, let me Brian look up the Planning Commission over yet. The NPC at this moment is not in a position to respond to that question. Um, we will not be deciding on what type of approach we want to take over the next few months. That's a, de a decision only the commissioners can make. So uh, I, I apologize, Luigi, I can't answer your question. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, for taking up so much time. Um, I do have one last uh, question. Uh, uh, in kind of uh, following in, in Miguel's footsteps about uh, different uh, approaches um, for the uh, mainland migratory and the tundra wintering um, caribou. Uh, is the GN uh, considering the potential for uh, regional approaches as well? Um, the reason I bring up the question is that uh, from a scientific basis, I think everybody's quite clear that the Bathurst caribou have changed their, their calving ground range. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody around the table is aware that IQ points out to two changes in that uh, carib caribou calving ground. The caribou calving ground right now is where it was historically 
and so, uh, and I believe uh, Mr. Kapalak would, would be able to speak to that if, uh, if he wishes to. So the, the, the reason I bring it up is because of the, the shifting nature of that, that calving ground. Um, one of the big concerns for the KIA is if we create a polygon uh, that is protectionist, if, the, if there is a shift once again, that polygon may stay on that map and it's ineffective at protecting in a different area. So um, is, is, is a regional approach something that the GN would be considering? So um, the GN is trying to tackle with its um, jurisdictional partners uh, a method of looking at uh, timelines of caller data to be used to define certain seasonal ranges, understanding that in some situations, although albeit they usually take a very long period of time for these sorts of shifts, um, that these shifts can occur. Um, I want to just clarify that this is over very long term. These are not things that just sort of flip back and forth. These are over decades, uh, if not longer, from what we've seen with most of these populations. So we are in the process of trying to determine how that might work so that areas that no longer are being used by caribou um, uh, and are considered by the communities and the, uh, the other co-management partners, biologists, et cetera, as being unimportant at that point in time could be adjusted within the land use plan. But that is a work in progress right now. We're looking into it though. So the, the short answer is yes, we're looking into that kind of thing. We're open to looking into that. Just so this group is aware, um, the original polygons that were developed, uh, and I, I believe Bruno, they're, we're reevaluating everything next year, I think, with all the new um, caller data. And so we'll be revisiting a lot of these things and uh, uh, a lot of people be in, will be involved in looking at them. And, but for right now, the polygons were sort of, we're holding them for five years and then we'll reevaluate and add new caller data to reassess those polygons. So it's, it is something we're open to looking at and it's something we're actually actively looking at right now, um, trying to establish a process that will offer the maximum amount of protection for these animals by identifying the, um, the key areas, the important areas, but also put, um, understand the biology of these areas and the temporal nature of these areas. I don't know if that helps, but generally we're open to looking into those sorts of things. Thanks. Last one, Luigi. So, Luigi Toretti, Katakmiori New Association. So sunset clauses are something that the GN would be uh, willing to consider. I'm sorry, Luigi, could you repeat that question? Uh, I apologize. Uh, sunset clauses. So a clause that indicates uh, for X period of time, uh, this uh, polygon is within the, uh, is accepted within the, the uh, land use plan, but after that sun sets, after that period lapses, uh, then either it needs to be renegotiated, all the parties need to come to the table and, and accept yes, the status quo is applicable, or nay, it's changed, there's the, the change in data, uh, and therefore uh, something else be implemented. So again, um, in terms of sunset clauses, would that be something that the GN would be interested in? I don't, I think, uh, you're making me think here, Luigi. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to hear from some of the other people if 
uh, around the table. Certainly, it would be something that I think would be reasonable to consider to revisit because we're always consulting and things are potentially changing. So on the surface, it sounds like a reasonable way forward. Um, we would want to make sure that that we would that would be well consulted uh, amongst our our communities and our RWOs, and then also consulted with our jurisdictional partners. But on the surface, it sounds like a a, a reasonable way forward. Um, uh, yes. And I think I would add that you're going to have to consult with your financial management board because uh, that's going to require a lot of monitoring. Um, <laughs> what was your name again? <laughs> Luis. Oh, come on, it's only started. <laughs> I've, heard, I've hardly even said anything. <laughs> <coughs> Miguel with NTI. Actually, actually I'm, I'm a bit concerned. I have, to, I have two things now because you said something that concerned me a bit. You, you represented the GN as saying that there would, they are no longer advocating for any protection in calving areas. And the, you, you, I believe that's what you said anyway. Uh, but I, the GN didn't object to that, and I was a little surprised because I'm pretty sure my understanding is that the GN is simply saying they're not asking for prohibitions on development in, in calving areas. And I just want to make sure that's, that's clear. Like, if I'm misunderstanding, uh, is, is there is there they're still advocating for protection just not prohibitions um, I don't know to be honest my understanding was that um, the GN's and I haven't seen anything in writing the GN's current position is that while they were it was advocating for protection um, the caribou uh, calving areas would be considered conservation zones in the, in the land use plan, they've, they've withdrawn from that position and have said, we'll consider on a case-by-case -case basis the um, best <coughs> approach um, to um, caribou protection throughout Nunavut. Right. So I interpret that personally and to say that the um, position that caribou calving grounds be effectively created uh, or designated as conservation areas is no longer valid. Um, Miguel with NTI. But that's just my opinion. Maybe somebody from GM. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. perhaps they should speak to it. Uh, Ask GN to speak to that. Sure. I'll let Denise answer this because I'm getting a little bit confused here what we're, what we're actually talking about. Actually, I'd appreciate that, Miguel, if you could. I, I hope this helps. I w I'll s David Lee with uh, NTI Wildlife. I would like to know what the GN policy statement or position is, please. Thank you. No, I'm not going to. Are you going to read it in? No. Okay, Denise Bakey with Government of Nunavut. Just to make everything less clear and more muddy, here's my attempt. So we're not necessarily advocating for habitat protection anymore? Is it being designated as a protected area polygon? Um, now understanding our position has to be fully fleshed out as this is a recent development. So as Steve stated earlier that we would support calving grounds, support development in calving grounds and key access corridors on a case by case basis with associated restriction, uh, seasonal restrictions mitigation plans, et cetera. The exact details of what we are going to implement have not been worked out yet, so I apologize if that made it worse. Miguel? Miguel with NTI. Now, now to my real question. That was just a concern from what, what you'd said. 
Um, and it, it's, it's, it's to Mitch. Mitch, in, uh, in the last technical meeting that we were at, you gave a presentation <coughs> called Finding the Balance. And in that presentation, and, and correct me if I, if I misread what you had on there, one point you'd said that if there were enough funding available, then mobile protection measures could be a feasible way of protecting the caribou. Um, I would ask, did you, did, you, did you have that in your presentation and could you clarify uh, what you meant by it? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay, so we're, my problem is we're zipping back and forth from old policy to new policy here. So if we go to the, the, the old one, which is no longer supported by the GN, in that policy, we, um, we did not say that mobile protection measures could replace area protection for calving. And I just want to add this caveat because I'm a biologist <laughs> and I, I need to add this caveat into this whole thing so to get out of this the policy thing because we all know the GN policy we're all aware of it um, from the biological standpoint I think it's it needs to be understood um, by everyone around this table and I'm just gonna give a little backdrop and I this is gonna help me sort of feel less confused and 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 people can respond to this as they like. I've been working on caribou for 30 years now. I've been on the calving grounds almost every year of that. Um, I've worked on woodland caribou and I've worked on piri caribou, but mostly I've worked on barren ground caribou. Uh, a lot of the elders and the uh, RWO reps around this table have been on caribou habitat a heck of a lot longer than I have. And they have a massive amount of knowledge as well on all of these. And I've spoken to many, and we've listened to many that have provided the feedback um, back to us. Uh, additionally, um, uh, we've been very thoroughly through the literature. Probably haven't seen everything that's out there, but there are dozens of papers that um, very clearly um, uh, delineate uh, potential impacts to caribou, et cetera. Um, so we've gone through that and, and justifying, you know, important caribou habitats and that sort of thing. From a biological standpoint, positions aside here, there is a reality to where we're going here. And the reality is uh, development on a calving ground will impact caribou. We know that. It's not something we're guessing about. There is some question as to what the magnitude of that effect will be, but it will impact caribou. And I just want to make sure that we're, we're very clear. And this is from a synthesis of my personal experience, of my experience um, working with colleagues uh, around the table and speaking with elders and hunters. So I, I, I feel I have to say that because that's who I am. That's, I'm, I'm a biologist and I want people to understand what is going to potentially happen, um, that there will be some sacrifices that will have to be made when we go into a cabin ground and develop in a cabin ground. So. Uh, I'm not speaking to any positions, I'm just trying to lay out the biology and say that that biology has not changed. That has stayed the same. In fact, um, the biology uh, with new research that's being done is becoming clearer. So that being said, I, 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 just because I was getting confused, I thought it was good to just put that out there on the table. And I think I can, I'm, I'm speaking for uh, my colleagues here as well that have looked into these issues as well. And I don't know if that helps or doesn't help or what it does, but but that doesn't change the current um, uh, policy framework that we have to work within now. Um, and um, clear as mud. Okay. Um, any other? Oh, just Miguel, one more. Yeah, Miguel from NTI. Yeah, I mean this is a, a technical session. 
So <coughs> positions aside, we all have to be aware of them, but uh, we're just talking here and, uh, and trying to figure things out. So uh, that's, thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess I'd reiterate, while the policy has changed, the science has not. So I, I guess I'd characterize the, the GN's current policy as, as uh, less risk averse than the previous one. Hannah, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Hannah from NTI. Um, I can appreciate the awkward situation you guys must be in, but Denise, you mentioned that um, the new policy has yet to be fully fleshed out. Will the policy be submitted to NPC? Because I don't think the decision was made publicly or released publicly, and just trying to understand where the GN is going with this. Um, Will we see something uh, in the near future? Thank you. Uh, Denise Baker. Oh, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> Denise Baker, Government of Nunavut. I assume this will be something that will be forthcoming in an NPC submission for on future land use planning submissions. Yeah, sure. Uh, Trickus Hassan, Director of Wildlife Management Government of Nunavut. Uh, there will be a media release later today from from Government of Nunavut on the decision that will clear, more clarify what the government position is right at this time. I just want to make another comment on that is that our previous position was that carving grounds are protected for development and that was our position to NPC to consider in the development of a land use plan. Now what we're saying is each each proposal will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. That is purely a recommendation, again, to NPC. Nothing prevents NPC from making a, re a position to say carving grounds are protected based on, I mean, it's, there's a lot of people around the table that provides input into this, not just the government of Nunavut. Uh, although we are a major player, I expect that you will consider input from everybody around the table in making your position, in developing a land use plan. Great, that's helpful. Warren? Thank you, Warren, with uh, KWB. Um, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, talking with my executive, um, with the other staff that's been around KWB a lot longer than me, um, they've really appreciated the GN showing up to their AGMs year after year and consulting really heavily with the KWB on their previous submission. It didn't reflect everything the hunters wanted, but uh, calving grounds was a big priority. Um, and given that, as the chair has uh, noted a few times, the policy may have changed, but the science hasn't, um, I do hope the NPC staff will consider the science that's been presented here and the other science when they're coming up with their final recommendation. Thank you. All right, any other uh, questions uh, before we move on? All right, um, so the next on the agenda is uh, a brief update by the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board on the um, workshop they held back in November. Uh, a number of folks weren't able to attend that workshop, so it'll, we've asked the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board to summarize the, uh, the results. Uh, thank you. This is Carla Leto with the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board. I'm going to apologize in advance if I get a coughing fit. I've been battling a cold, so if I do, Peter will take over for me. Uh, so thank you for giving the NWMB an opportunity to speak at this technical meeting. Um, I'm just going to address both the, uh, the Caribou Workshop, but also just give a little overview about the NWMB and our position. So for those of you who do not know, the NWMB is a quasi-judicial tribunal with decision-making responsibility, acting as the main instrument of wildlife management and the main regulator of access to wildlife in the Nunavut settlement area. There are a number of provisions. Well, could you slow down a little bit? Thank you. There are a number of provisions in the NLCA that give the NWMB authority to play an active role in the management and protection of Nunavut's wildlife habitat. These include the provision of advice on mitigation measures to be required from developers who damage wildlife habitat, 
which is section 5.2.34E, the approval of the establishment, disestablishment, and changes to boundaries of conservation areas related to management and protection of wildlife and wildlife habitat, which is section 5.2.34A, the approval of plans for management and protection of particular wildlife habitats, 5.2.34 and the identification of wildlife management zones and areas of high biological productivity and the provision of recommendations to the Nunavut Planning Commission with respect to planning in those areas, which is section 5.2.34b. In May 2014, the NWMB passed a resolution recommending the full protection of caribou calving and post calving areas, which included a prohibition of mining exploration and development, and that NWMB position has not changed. This position was forwarded to the Planning Commission in our May 2014 and June 2015 submissions. So as most of you are aware, the NWMB hosted a workshop in early November 2014 called Protecting Caribou and Their Habitat. The purpose of the workshop was to bring together Inuit hunters and organizations, community members, wildlife scientists, and wildlife managers to share and discuss current scientific and traditional knowledge on the effects of disturbance caused by human land use activities on caribou and caribou habitat and suggest recommendations on how to effectively manage and or protect caribou and caribou habitat in Nunavut for the long-term sustainability of the species. The workshop was not intended to lead to one or more specific NWMB decisions or recommendations for the protection of caribou and caribou habitat, and it was not a forum for promoting or advancing a formal party or departmental political position. However, the NWMB may use the information heard at the workshop to assist the board in performing its functions related to the management and protection of caribou habitat as per Article 5 of the NLCA. So prior to that workshop, the NWMB issued a contract to a legal firm to conduct a review of legal jurisdiction on caribou habitat protection, mainly with respect to mineral exploration and development. As well, the NWMB issued a contract for a literature review on the impacts of human activities on barren ground caribou with a focus on IQ, scientific information, and caribou protection measures. The literature review was based on inf information post-2010 to, oh no, oh no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, we're gonna need to, if you could say a sentence or two and then pause, that'd be great. The literature review was based on material post-2010. Sections of that literature review is currently being reviewed and edited and will be made publicly available once complete. The NWMB also provided funding to the Baker Lake Hunters and Trappers Organization to conduct an IQ literature review and workshop in their community. Presentations on the initial findings of the legal review, literature review, and Baker Lake IQ workshop were presented at the NWMB's Caribou workshop in November. A report on the NWMB's workshop is still under development. We hope to have it complete before this technical meeting, but unfortunately we're not able to do so. However, that report should soon be circulated to workshop participants for feedback and will be submitted to the Planning Commission along with the literature review uh, for their June hearing submission deadline. Today, I can present the 11 points of agreement that were drafted by our NWMB Legal Council at the conclusion of the workshop. These points of agreement have been circulated to participants and are available on our workshop, uh, on our, sorry, on our website. I've also got some handouts here that I will send around. So just reading from the draft points of agreement, 
Number one, both Inuit Kayamanakangit and science provide useful information and guidance concerning caribou and caribou habitat protection issues. Number two, it is necessary to include IQ information on maps addressing caribou and caribou habitat protection. Number three, IQ and science are essentially in agreement based upon reliable and persuasive evidence with respect to caribou and caribou habitat protection issues, particularly regarding the vital importance of caribou calving areas, post calving areas, water crossings, and access corridors. Number four, currently there appears to be no reasonable legal or policy balance between development and protection in core caribou habitat. Number five, establishing protected areas is generally a more effective conservation action for the protection of core caribou habitat and vulnerable caribou populations than simply establishing protection measures. Number six, particularly considering the presently low caribou population numbers in Nunavut, the high economic, social, and cultural value of caribou and caribou habitat to Inuit, and ongoing exploration and development activities throughout the territory. It is urgent that prompt and effective steps be taken by management authorities to ensure the protection of this irreplaceable natural resource. Number seven, the establishment under Nunavut's Wildlife Act of special management areas and accompanying regulatory safeguards appears to be an effective and appropriate legal action for the protection of caribou and caribou habitat. Number eight, a caribou zone of influence is a useful concept to apply in considering overall caribou and caribou habitat protection. Number nine, mobile caribou conservation measures deserves careful examination and consideration for example, within buffer zones in the vicinity of a protected area. Number 10, caribou and caribou habitat, protected areas and protection measures, once decided upon, must be clearly expressed and conveyed to all those affected. And finally, number 11, to ensure effective caribou and caribou habitat protection, adequate funding is required for communications, implementation, monitoring, and enforcement. So in conclusion, the NWMB would like to echo other parties that we heard from today in saying that we need to take a precautionary approach when considering the protection of caribou and sensitive caribou habitat. To quote the federal judge that ruled in the 1978 case between the federal government and the community of Baker Lake regarding mineral exploration and development in the region at that time. The minerals, if there, will remain. The caribou presently there may not. We think this is important advice that the NPC should keep in mind when revising the draft Nunavut land use plan. So now if Peter has anything to add. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions of the Wildlife Management Board? Seems pretty clear. Yeah, Spencer. Hi, Spencer Dewar from INAC. I was just wondering um, what's meant by a zone of influence as a concept? Um, so the zone of influence was a, a presentation that was delivered at the workshop by Kim Poole. It's based on a paper that uh, he was a co-author with, with uh, Jean Boulanger. It uh, 
Mitch might want to chime in there as well. He might know more about it, but it's basically looking at how far outside you can see from where an activity is taking place, of where you can still see the impacts of that activity. And uh, looking at a case uh, for the Bathurst caribou, it, uh, it measured a certain distance out where the effects of disturbance could be measured. And it was uh, linked as well with dust accumulation on lichen. So it's a possibility that the dust created from roads is going out so far that it could be affecting the vegetation and forage for caribou and thus affecting how far they come to the disturbance. Yeah, and Kim will be on the phone this evening, so if there are questions of him about the zone of influence disc um, concept, uh, they can be raised then. Um, any other comments? Ops yeah, Leslie. Hi, Leslie Wakeman, BQCMB. I just had a quick question on one of them and I didn't get the handout, so I'm not sure which number it is. Uh, number seven, okay. I was wondering if there'd been any progress on trying to figure out if the um, GN's legislation would be useful to establish special management areas under, under uh, the Wildlife Act. Thanks. GM. Uh, Trickers Kissing, Government of Nunavut. They are already under our Wildlife Act, but we do not have regulations in place yet, and that's something we are considering. Yes. I'm just going to add to Trickers' comment there. Um, the NWMB is still interested in pursuing that option um, and has sent out a letter to co-management partners requesting a meeting to look at that, um, looking at the wildlife regs in particular as an option forward. Thank you. And I, I would guess that uh, uh, we'll be influenced by the GN's po recent policy decision about protection of caribou habitat. Um, any other comments, questions? All right, let's... Um, Let's move on then to the Kivalik Wildlife Board and a presentation regarding uh, freshwater crossings. We touched on that earlier today, but Warren, are you the lead? Okay. Thank you very much, David. This is Warren for the Kivalik Wildlife Board. <coughs> um, Leah Makpa, our original coordinator, was uh, going to co-present with me. She's not uh, available today, so I'll do my best. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit not just about the importance of water crossings, but just kind of the approach that KWB has taken to IQ. Thanks. And when Leah gets here, she'll talk a bit more about the engagement that we went through with elders, with the public, and with the HTO boards to arrive at these conclusions. So the approach that we've taken towards trying to inform our positions with IQ is, I guess, twofold. The first was documenting the traditional rules that Inuit have for protecting caribou habitat. Because there's quite extensive rules um, around how hunters should treat different habitat areas. So extensive that I would say that Inuit had their own traditional land use plans well before the Canadian government and scientists and policymakers ever arrived. <coughs> and the second is documenting Inuit values around caribou habitat. Because the definition of IQ that uh, commonly gets circulated emphasizes that it's not just information and observations, it also deals in the realm of values and cultural values, so we tried to focus on that as well. <coughs> so in terms of the traditional rules, um, as Carla mentioned, uh, the NWMB funded some research for us. Um, 
we did a literature review of the sort of traditional caribou habitat protection methods, looking at anthropology, archaeology, oral history, traditional knowledge studies, uh, and on and on. It's, there's a quite extensive literature on this, actually. And we also held workshops with each HTO in the Kivalik region on this topic. The reports on this work are included in all of the HTO submissions to the Planning Commission, which have been on the Planning Commission's website for some time now. I would especially recommend the um, reports that were appended to the Baker Lake HTO submission. So um, first I'd like to talk a bit about the traditional rules about water crossings that we documented. And I think these help explain the, uh, the reason why the HTOs and the KWB has been pushing so hard to protect these areas. So according to the workshop that we held and a really extensive list of academic literature, um, there's a lot of rules that Inuit followed traditionally around how to treat a water crossing when you're hunting or camping near it. For example, uh, the elders teach not to hunt or camp on the side of the river where the caribou enter the water. Because any change to the landscape there can really um, affect their migrations and make them cross somewhere else. They also teach not to cache caribou or camp too close to the crossing or build cabins too close to the crossing. The elders also said they were taught to not leave carcasses too close to the crossing and to make sure that they leave those areas especially, especially clean. They also said they were taught to be extremely quiet, especially close to a crossing and not to disturb the first caribou in the herd or the first group of caribou that migrate through. Because if you disturb those, you'll mess up the whole migration. Now I should say that historically, for inland Inuit, the water crossings were one of the most important hunting sites. The fall caribou hunt at the water crossings is where most of the inland groups that live in Baker Lake and Arviat today got almost all of their food and clothing for the winter. And as a result, there's a lot of archeological resources around these areas. And, the, and a lot of elders have emphasized to us during these workshops that they don't want these artifacts removed or moved around. Um, And I think it's worth pointing out that archaeologists have even found that the archaeological record reflects these traditional rules. And there's a number of papers that have been written on this that you don't find many artifacts on the side of the river where the caribou enter the water. Most of the artifacts are found over a hill out of sight of the water crossing. There's not a lot of bones and other fragments nearby. Like, the archaeological record testifies that Inuit followed these rules very closely historically. And water crossings, especially to Baker Lake and Arviat, remain extremely important to hunting today. Especially along the Magoose River for Arviat, the Thelon and Kazan Rivers for Baker Lake, and the east end of Baker Lake and the north and sh south channels into Chesterfield Inlet for Baker Lake and Chester. They're still very heavily used. Uh, so that's water crossings. In terms of calving grounds, we also heard some traditional rules that um, elders were taught and continue to teach in terms of managing the hunt to protect calving ground habitat. First of all is the traditional hunting seasons. 
All of the HTOs told me that the calving and post-calving season is bull hunting season. And that they were told to leave calves and cows alone during the calving and post-calving season. The elders in Whale Cove told me that they were taught to stay out of the calving grounds entirely during the calving season and to stay closer to the coast and leave the caribou alone in their calving grounds while they're having babies. The elders in Arviat told me that they emphasized to younger hunters that they shouldn't be building cabins in the calving grounds because these permanent structures will disturb them. And in Chesterfield Inlet, an elder told me, we will never stop trying to protect the calving grounds. It is a part of our culture. So um, with regards to both calving grounds and water crossings, the elders uh, said that their traditional rules are inconsistent with mining. Like how can you have an open pit right next to a water crossing if you can't even leave like a caribou bone li lying around? So I'd like to just say a couple of things about um, the value that Inuit uh, in the Kivalik place around protecting these areas. And I think this is reflected in the long history of trying to protect these areas, which Basil touched on a bit this morning when he gave her opening remarks. Um, and a lot of this activity was focused on Baker Lake. Um, the community made numerous land freeze proposals during the 1970s, asking the federal government to stop issuing permits for exploration until a land claim is settled. <coughs> and according to my discussions with Joan Scotty, who was the research assistant for the consulting study that was done, the consultant study that was done in 1976, one of the big focuses with this land freeze was they wanted to have, especially water crossings, but also migration routes and calving areas protected. Then the government proposed special measures, which eventually became the caribou protection measures to deal with this issue. And the community responded that these seasonal measures aren't enough, and that's what turned into the, court, the Baker Lake court case. Uh, and in Baker Lake, the Kigavik mine has been a pr um, proposed twice now, once in the late 1980s, once just recently. And in both situations, a major concern that the community had was that Kigavik would induce further development, that once you build the road and the mill out to Kigavik, it's a uranium-rich area, so you're going to start seeing more roads, more mines, more open pits. And both times, there was a concern that this development could spill over into calving grounds. <coughs> the first time around, it was because UG, the company at the time, was actively exploring in the Beverly calving grounds. And that was, according to some uh, people that I've talked to, including Joan, who was very active in this, that was detrimental to their relationship with the community. And this time around with Kigavik, uh, both the Baker HTO, the Chester HTO, the Nowyad HTO, and the Kivalik Wildlife Board all said that they wouldn't support Kigavik until there was a proper land use plan in place with firm protection for critical caribou habitat so that this induced development wouldn't spill out into the calving grounds. And the KWB passed a resolution to this end, which I'll hand out after I'm done talking to maybe provide a bit more background and context. And then since then, there's been the struggles over Erevan wanting to drill in the Beverly calving grounds, and Konia trying to get into the um, Kamenariuak calving grounds, and they are in there. Um, so there's a long history of this, of hunters standing up and speaking their mind about this, and I think this shows some clear local values around protecting this critical habitat 
and not wanting mining there. And as Basil said this morning, hunters in Baker Lake would not accept mining in calving grounds. It's, there's a line in the sand and for them that crosses that line. And based on uh, the HTO's public engagement in other communities, uh, radio call-in shows, consultation with elders, I really don't think Baker Lake's alone on this. So I think we should really question why the government of Nunavut is promoting development in calving grounds at this point. When within at least the communities I've dealt with, I don't think a mine in the calving grounds could ever get a social license. I don't know. I can't imagine there could be any mitigation measures that would truly make hunters comfortable with a mine right in the middle of the calving grounds. And I've heard the same comments from HTO chairs from numerous communities in the Kivalik. And uh, I think I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Any, uh, any comments? Questions? A strong presentation. Um, Jackie, do you want to update us on the um, next item here? Thank you, Jackie Price, Kikitalik Wildlife Board. Um, if you look at your agenda, you'll see there are two times QWB was um, allocated a space to discuss um, some of the IQ they have collected. A QWB did have a proposal to hold a workshop prior to this meeting, but due to a variety of uh, external factors, including accommodation, uh, QWB made the decision to not <coughs> to postpone that workshop. Uh, this was not an easy decision, but uh, one that we just we just had to make. So officially, QWB doesn't have anything to add to f um, under the seasonal range or the planning tools. But again, I do want to reiterate that uh, QWB is planning to still hold a workshop. And this workshop will be held in preparation to meet NPC's June deadline for submissions for the public hearing. Uh, so please stay tuned. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Any, uh, any comments, observations? All right. Um, I, I think I'm going to call it for the afternoon. We're at um, 4.30 or, or close to it in any case. And on schedule, and I, I think uh, the forecast for tomorrow is somewhat grim. So I th think it's, it will be wise to have the evening session as scheduled and see how much we can get done then. And, uh, and then we'll see what the weather brings tomorrow morning. 